welcome back to Harbour Unbox. Today we are taking our first real look at VRM thermal performance and on hand are a number of Intel B660 motherboards. Of course we have boards from all the usual suspects, MSI, Gigabyte, ASUS, but we've also got, well we've got, we've got ASRock as well. There's another ASRock board somewhere here. Uh, but we also have some other interesting brands such as Soyo and Maxun. Maxun boards hiding down there. Now, pricing starts at just under $100 US, and we'll be covering every board that I could get my hands on priced from $100-ish US right up to $140. I do have eight boards priced between $150 right up to $200 US, and we'll look at those in what'll be sort of a mid-range part two, let's say. Hopefully that'll be on the channel quite shortly. For now though, we do have 10 budget models to check out, and we'll start by briefly going over each of the boards, and then we'll jump into stuff like the test system setup and of course the results. Okay, starting from the bottom, and I do mean that in more ways than one, we have the ASRock B660M HDV, which we've already exposed to being a very, very bad product. So I won't spend too much time on it here. This board features a five phase vehicle using Sinopower MOSFETs. On the low side are two SM4373 FETs, and on the high side, a single SM4508 FET. It's a very weak VRM that can really only sustain a throughput of around 70 to 80 watts, before hitting the thermal limit and throttling. Although it is the cheapest board featured in this roundup, at least based on the current US pricing, the inadequate VRM and lackluster feature set make it a rather poor value offering. I've also purchased the more expensive ASRock B660 Pro RS, which currently sells for $140, though I've got to say for that price, this is an extremely underwhelming product, VRM performance aside. The I.O. panel, for example, features just four USB 3.2 Gen 1 ports with two USB 2.0 ports. There's a single HDMI output along with a display port output, and then we have Gigabit LAN. It's a weak feature set, and again, ASRock has gone with Sinopower MOSFETs, this time going with a seven-phase vehicle with two SM4508 FETs on the higher side and two SM4373 FETs on the low side. That's a very low quality VRM at the $140 US price point, so it'll be interesting to see how the B660 Pro RS performs. Moving on to ASUS, the cheapest board I was able to find was the ASUS Prime B660M-K, and I believe this is the lowest end model that ASUS is selling in Australia, as I wasn't able to source the EX B660M V5 or Pro B660MC on AliExpress. And I should just point out that ASUS didn't want to provide these entry-level boards, so both boards featured in this video we did go out and purchase. At $120, the B660M-K is one of the cheaper boards we have on hand, and in terms of features, it is very basic. Again, there's just four USB 3.2 Gen 1 ports on the I.O. panel, and two USB 2.0 ports. You're again looking at basic audio with gigabit LAN support, two DIMM slots, and no noteworthy features to speak of. So it's a very basic board at this price point. For the VRM, ASUS has gone with a six-phase vCore using a single on-semi 4C10B FET on the high side and a 4C06B FET on the low side. This should perform better than the base model ASRock board, but I'm still not expecting amazing results. The only other sub $150 US board that I was able to find was the ASUS Prime B660M-A. And again, I did have to purchase this board as ASUS was unwilling to provide it. The B660M-A is another MATX board, though this model is a bit more costly at $140 US. For that extra $20, you get an additional HDMI port on the IO panel, along with display port support, and the USB 3.2 ports have been upgraded to Gen 2. The primary M.2 slot now gets a heatsink, the VRM heatsink is larger, and the PCIe x1 slots have been replaced with x16 slots for compatibility with full-length cards, while the bottom slot now offers x4 bandwidth. You also get four DIMM slots as well. As for the VRM, it's still a six-phase vCore, but this time it's using Vachet MOSFETs with an SIRA14DP FET on the higher side and two SIRA12DP FETs on the low side. Moving on, we have some Gigabyte boards, and the cheapest of which is the B660M Gaming at what I believe will be about $105 US, but at the time of making this video, there are no US-based listings, so it's B660 
bit of a guess really. Here in Australia, this model costs $190 AUD, which is about $20 AUD more than the ASRock B660 MHDV. In terms of features, this is a pretty impressive looking board given the price, and it really blows away the ASUS and ASRock offerings. At the I.O. panel, you'll find four USB 3.2 Gen 2 ports, one of which is a Type-C, and then there are two USB 2.0 ports. And then Gigabyte's also included an HDMI output along with a display port, and you even get 2.5 gigabit LAN. The board though does only pack two DIMM slots, and the VRM heatsinks only offer half coverage. Then for the VRM, Gigabyte has gone with a six-phase V-Core using a single on-semi 4C10N FET on the high side, and two 4C06N FETs on the low side. I've also got the Gigabyte B660M DS3H, which comes in a few different versions, and these include varying degrees of wireless networking support. It's again unclear as to exactly what price this model will sell for in the US, as it is yet to go on sale, but using the Australian pricing as a rough guide, it's basically the same price as the B660M Gaming at $195 AUD, a mere 3% price premium. For that small price increase, the DS3H does away with the gamer nonsense, and instead you get an extra DisplayPort output. An M.2 heatsink is also included, and you get the full four DIMM slots, and an extra PCIe x1 slot. So in my opinion, this is the better value offering. As for the VRM, the same configuration and components have again been used. Then finally, the most expensive Gigabyte B660 board to be featured in this roundup is the B660M D3H, and this one is on sale in the US for $120, or here in Australia it's $230 AUD, so it's almost 20% more than the DS3H. For that premium, you get a slightly larger VRM heatsink, though it is still only half coverage, which is quite disappointing. You get a full-length primary M.2 slot with a heatsink, a second PCIe x16 slot with up to 8x bandwidth, and better audio support. Overall, it is a pretty impressive looking board given the price point, and it really blows away the ASUS and ASRock offerings. As for the VRM, Gigabyte has again gone with the same six-phase V-Core using a single on-semi 4C10N FET on the high side, with two 4C06N FETs on the low side. Now, MSI has just a single board in the sub $150 price range, and that board is the Pro B660M-A, which starts at $140 US, though the Wi-Fi version does cost $10 more. Over in Australia, it costs $240 AUD, which is just $10 more than the Gigabyte B660M D3H. So this is one of the more expensive models in our roundup, but it also looks to be one of the most promising. It's without question the most premium looking board, and it certainly looks to be a class above the ASUS Prime B660M-A, for example. The I.O. panel features two USB 3.2 Gen 2 ports, as well as two USB 3.2 Gen 1 ports, and then two USB 2.0 ports. There's also two display outputs and two HDMI outputs, and the VRM is completely covered by two large heatsinks, while the primary M.2 slot gets a heatsink. There's also four DIMM slots, four SATA ports, a second full-length PCIe x16 slot, and 2.5 gigabit networking, so it is a very well-equipped board. It also has a really interesting VRM, which sees the V-Core portion made up of a dozen Alpha and Omega FETs. On the low side are AONS36303 FETs, and on the high side AONS36308 FETs. I've not tested a board with these components before, but on paper they look good enough, and there should be enough of them, so I'm expecting solid results from this board. Okay, so this is an interesting addition to our B660 VRM testing, the Maxun B660M Challenger. I came across this board on AliExpress, and with free delivery, it ended up costing the same amount as the ASRock B660M HDV, though over in the US it will cost around $25 US more. Now, although we're yet to see just how good this board is or isn't, I'd be hesitant to purchase it on the basis that warranty will be difficult as it's coming out of China and nothing is guaranteed there. Basically, I think you'd be praying that nothing went wrong. BIOS support's also a bit sketchy, and thus far, not a single update has been released. Those issues aside though, the B660M Challenger does look to be a solid board with large VRM heat sinks covering the entire VRM, and they also extract heat from the inductors, which is a very nice touch. That said, it does only feature a single PCIe x16 slot with an additional x1 slot, and that's it.
There's also just two DIMM slots and three SATA ports, but the I.O. panel is reasonably well stocked with four USB 3.2 ports and two USB 2.0 ports, along with two display ports and a single HDMI output. The really cool thing about this board though is the VRM. It uses Vache SIC 654 50 amp power stages and making up the V-Core portion are eight of these power stages. And that makes this one of the best VRMs we've seen at this price range, at least on paper. The last board that we have to go over is the Soyo B660M Classic. And this was another AliExpress deal, which I was able to land for $170 Australian. So the same price as the Maxun B660M Challenger and the terrible ASRock B660M HDV. The similarities with the Maxun board don't stop with the price though. In fact, they're really just the same board with some minor design or rather theme differences. The heat sinks are essentially the same dimensions with a slight change to the design. The physical board layout and component choices are identical. And that means the B660M Classic also uses eight Fache SIC 654 50 amp power stages for the V-Core portion of the VRM. So performance should be very similar between these two products. Now, before we get to the graphs, let's talk about the test conditions. For this testing and any future LJ1700 VRM thermal testing, I've built a dedicated system inside the Corsair IQ7000X case, and powering it, we have the HX1000 power supply, and then for cooling, the Corsair IQH170i Elite Capelix. The IQ7000X has been configured with a single rear 140mm exhaust fan and three 140mm intake fans, so that is the stock configuration for that case. Then in the top of the case, I've installed the H170i 420mm radiator with three 140mm exhaust fans. This is a pretty high-end configuration. I'd say airflow is good. And in a 21 degree room, I'd also say this is an optimal setup, which we're going to call standard airflow. Now for this testing, I've also included a direct airflow configuration, which includes an additional 120mm fan covering the VRM. This is without question an absolute best case scenario for any system. And unless you're willing to do this, it's not really a realistic configuration, I suppose, but I wanted to give these budget boards the best chance possible of actually working. Then for recording temperatures, I'm using a digital thermometer with K-type thermocouples and I'm reporting the peak rear PCB temperature. I'm also not reporting Delta T over ambient, instead I maintain a room temperature of 21 degrees. And to ensure a consistent ambient temperature, a thermocouple is positioned next to the test system. As for the stress test, I'm using Cinebench R23, which has been looped for an hour, at which point I'm reporting the maximum PCB temperature, again recorded using K-type thermocouples, and also reporting the final Cinebench score. But please note, the score is only the final pass and not an average of all the passes completed in the hour-long loop. So the score may not necessarily represent what was seen during heavy throttling, though in most cases it is quite accurate. Okay, let's get into it. Starting with the Core i9-12900K data with our standard direct airflow setup, here we're looking at performance using the stock out-of-the-box board power configurations. That is to say, I've made no adjustments to how the boards behave. Most entry-level B660 boards will limit the 12900K to a PL1 of 125 watts, with the only exceptions being the ASUS Prime B660M-A, which allows for up to 200 watts, and the ASRock B660M HDV, which limits power to just 65 watts, and then we do have the MSI Pro B660M-A, which by default runs K-SKU parts without any power limits in place. So that means the CPU just uses as much power as it needs, and in the case of the 1200K, that's around 240 watts. Quite shockingly, of all the boards that run at 125 watts out of the box, the Soyo and Maxun boards, which are essentially the same boards with slightly different branding and small alterations to the heat sinks, they delivered the best results. The Soyo B660M Classic was particularly impressive, peaking at just 77 degrees and allowing the 1200K to produce a score of 22,000 points. The only better result was seen from the MSI Pro B660M-A, though at 103 degrees it did run extremely hot despite not throttling the CPU, and this allowed for the highest score of all at just over 27,000 points. The Gigabyte boards were quite average, it has to be said, only allowing for a score of around 19,000 points while running up around 100 degrees. Then the terrible boards, of course, include the ASRock B660 MHDV, but also disappointingly, the much more expensive B660 Pro RS, which was a lot better than the HDV, but only slightly outperformed the Soyo and Maxun boards while running dangerously hot. 
The ASUS Prime B660M-K was also very disappointing with a score of just 18,575 points and a PCB temperature of 111 degrees. Now, with the board power limits removed, or maxed out, we see that all boards struggled with the 12900K, which really is to be expected. In fact, the only board capable of extracting the maximum performance from the i9 processor was the MSI Pro B660M-A, and again, despite running very hot, it survived several hours under these conditions while allowing the 1200K to post scores in excess of 27,000 points. So while not ideal operating temperatures, that is a tremendous result for a B660 motherboard. The next best performing board was the ASUS Prime B660M-A, which was 16% slower than the MSI model with a final score of 22,771 points. The Soyo and Maxun boards again did very well, all things considered, especially when compared to boards from Gigabyte and ASRock, as well as the ASUS Prime at B660M-K. It's worth noting that removing the power limits did break a few boards in the sense that they couldn't handle the load and therefore invoked heavy throttling, which saw operating temperatures spike while Cinebench scores fell. A good example of this is the ASRock B660 Pro RS, which ran much hotter with the power limits removed, despite dropping 22% of its original performance, suggesting this board can't handle much over 125 watts for sustained periods of time, at least without additional airflow, and we'll look at that now. For the direct airflow test, I've strapped a 120mm fan directly over the VRM to maximise airflow, admittedly beyond what most users are going to do. But I really wanted to show a best case scenario for these budget boards, for those of you willing to help them out. And this is particularly useful for boards without heat sinks, though there are a few of those in this test. With direct airflow, the Soyo and Maxun boards tumbled in temperature to below 50 degrees, though here they are limiting the 1200K to a PL1 of 125 watts, and this does limit the performance to just over 22,000 points. The MSI Pro B660M-A, which runs 125 watt parts like the 1200K without any power limits, it only ran at 66 degrees, while allowing for full performance. The ASUS Prime B660M-A also enjoyed the direct airflow and is now able to max out its stock 200 watt limit with a score of 26,724 points. It was still slower than the MSI board and ran eight degrees hotter, but that's a much better result than what was seen previously with the standard airflow configuration. The only board to really suck here other than the ASRock B660 HDV was the ASUS Prime B660M-K, which hit 97 degrees while limiting the 1200K to one of the lowest scores seen. Now, with the power limits removed, the MSI B660M-A is again king of the sub $150 USB 660 boards, hitting just 66 degrees while enabling the highest level of performance seen with a score of just over 27,000 points. Then we see that the Soyo and Maxun boards again did very well, despite the fact that they couldn't quite get the most out of the 1200K due to some kind of bias limitation, as they didn't appear to be varum throttling. The ASUS Prime B660M-A avoided thermal throttling, so again, this model works quite well if provided direct airflow in a cool environment. The Gigabyte boards are also quite average, running very hot for a very limited performance, and in this scenario, really weren't any better than the ASRock B660M HDV. Meanwhile, the B660 Pro RS did perform quite well in terms of its Cinebench score, but at 119 degrees, it was dangerously hot, and that temperature alone is enough to give it a fail here. Moving on, we have the Core i7-12700 results, and once again, we'll start with the stock power results using our standard airflow configuration. This time the MSI Pro B660M-A defaulted to 65 watts, as did the ASRock boards, while all other boards ran at 125 watts, and the ASUS Prime B660M-A ran at 200 watts. This does highlight how weak the ASRock B660 Pro RS really is, because despite the 65 watt limit, it still peaked at 78 degrees, while the MSI Pro B660M-A at the same power limit hit just 46 degrees. The Soyo B660M Classic was also 23% faster than the Pro RS, despite running at the same VRM temperature. Now, removing the power limits gives us a better idea of how these B660 boards compare when paired with the Core i7-12700, and it's the MSI Pro B660M-A that stands out as being by far the best solution here, peaking at just 70 degrees 
while enabling the full performance of the Core i7 processor. The next best boards include the Maxun Challenger and Soyo Classic, followed by the ASUS Prime B660M-A. The big disappointment here was again the ASRock B660 Pro RS, which peaked dangerously high at 120 degrees, while only matching the Cinebench score of the Maxun and Soyo boards. Now with direct airflow, all boards ran much cooler, and here we are running the boards with their stock power limits in place. Incredibly, this saw the MSI Pro B660M-A run at just 33 degrees, while with the same configuration, the ASRock B660 Pro RS went as high as 57 degrees, which is still an acceptable operating temperature, but it's also quite horrible when compared to the MSI board, which retails for the same price. Now, with the power limits removed, the MSI Pro B660MA is still the best performer, peaking at just 49 degrees, with one of the highest scores seen. Again, the Sawyer and Maxun boards performed exceptionally well, as did the ASUS Prime B660M-A, which really enjoys the direct airflow. The Gigabyte boards, along with the ASRock B660 Pro RS, are passable here, but also very weak when compared to the top three boards. Then we have the ASUS Prime B660M-K, which did work and avoided any serious throttling, but given the test conditions, this is basically a fail. Finally, we have the Core i5-12600K results, and this CPU drops power usage down to 120 to 130 watts, so a much lighter workload for these boards. Using the standard airflow setup with the stock power limits in place, the MSI Pro B660M-A was able to run the 12600K unrestricted, peaking it to 61 degrees for a score of just over 17,000 points. And the next best was once again the Soyo and Maxun boards, and although they performed slightly worse than the MSI model, they were much better than the majority of the boards tested. The ASUS Prime B660M-A also performed reasonably well, so this model, despite its 200 watt configuration, is best suited for sustained 125 watt loads. Now, with the power limits removed, we get to see how these boards really handle a 120 to 130 watt load in a 21 degree environment with standard airflow. The MSI B660M-A is again class leading, peaking it to 61 degrees while unlocking the full performance of the 12600K. Under the same conditions, the Soyo B660M Classic hit 77 degrees, while the Maxun version hit 82 degrees, and the difference there being the heatsink design and maybe a difference in thermal pads or thermal pad contact. The only other acceptable result was provided by the ASUS Prime B660M-A. Beyond that, the rest of the boards ran up near 100 degrees, which is disappointing given that we're only talking about 120 to 130 watt load. Now, with direct airflow provided by a 120mm fan, the 12600K pushed the MSI Pro B660M-A to 40 degrees and the Soyo B660M Classic to just 41 degrees, while the Maxun B660M Challenger hit 43 degrees. The ASUS Prime B660MA was the only other standout hitting 48 degrees. The Gigabyte boards, along with the ASRock B660 Pro RS and ASUS Prime B660M-K, they all did pass and allowed the 12600K to achieve its maximum performance while keeping thermals at acceptable levels. The results were just disappointing relative to the MSI Soyo and Maxun boards. Finally, with the direct airflow set up and the power limits removed, the temperature of the Soyo and Maxun boards did increase slightly while the MSI Pro B660M-A remained at 40 degrees, as it was already running without power limits. The ASUS Prime B660M-A also performed quite well, with the rest of the boards hovering up around the 70 degree mark, and the only failure here would be the ASRock B660M HDV, which still limited the performance of the 12600K. Okay, so it took quite a bit of effort to get here, many, many weeks of testing, but we've now tested the boards, of course we've we've looked at each one briefly and then we've put them to the test and looked at the data. And after all of that, it is quite clear that the best board here by quite some margin is the MSI Pro B660M-A. And for me, the most important data set was seen with the Core i7-1200 without any power limits in our standard airflow setup. And here MSI blew the competition away. And then even with direct airflow, it did remain a cut above the rest. It even edged out the Soyo and Maxun boards, which were quite impressive in their own right. The ASUS Prime B660M-A was decent for the most part, but at $140, it struggled to compete with the MSI Pro B660M-A, and under many of the test conditions, it really just failed to compete at all. 
And for those of you using the Prime B660M-A with a Core i7 processor, or perhaps are hoping to upgrade to a Core i7 or better in the future, providing the VRM with direct airflow really is a must for optimal performance. Plus, it certainly doesn't hurt to keep those VRM temperatures in check. The more affordable ASUS Prime B660M-K result was very disappointing, and I don't recommend this board at the current $120 US asking price, as there are better alternatives, not to mention the MSI Pro B660M-A is just $20 more and well worth that extra investment. Sadly, Gigabyte has delivered underwhelming performance with its B660M D3H, DS3H, and gaming boards, and it's a shame because feature-wise these boards are very well equipped. So if you're only looking for a B660 board to pair with a Core i5-12400 or lower, then these options will work well enough. They do though limit your upgrade path, as even with direct airflow, the 12700 push them up around 80 degrees, which is workable, but some performance will be sacrificed and you will need direct airflow in a cool environment. The ASRock B660 Pro RS was generally slightly worse than the Gigabyte boards in terms of VRM thermals and CPU performance, while offering less features, so at $140 US, I'd give that board a wide berth, especially given for the same money you can snap up the MSI Pro B660M-A. The only other boards worth talking about are of course the Soyo B660M Classic and Maxun B660M Challenger clones. These boards can be purchased in the US for about $120, so that means they are far better value for Australian buyers who can land them for $170 AUD, which is what you'll pay for the ASRock B660 MHDV. So they are as cheap as B660 boards get down under. Now, the VRM performance was very good and the CPU performance was solid, despite falling short of the MSI Pro B660M-A in most tests. Value-wise though, these boards do look good, despite being rather light on features, let's say, but again, given the price, it is hard to fault them. The only real issue as I see it is the warranty and of course ongoing support as the Chinese website is slow and difficult to navigate while BIOS updates are probably going to be in short supply. So although I do believe that these boards are of reasonable quality and certainly worth using, I think that for that peace of mind, I'd rather spend a little bit more to secure something like the MSI Pro B660MA, something that you can purchase locally, and if you have any problems with it, you can take it back to the local store that you bought it from. And needless to say, the Pro B660M-A is my ultimate entry-level pick, though admittedly the $140 US price tag does make it a bit, well, pricey as an entry-level board. Now, the cheapest locally sold board that I would bother with would be the Gigabyte B660M D3H or the DS3H. And those boards have really nice feature sets for around $110 to $120 US. Of course, the only issue being the rather weak VRM performance, but if you're going to pair it with a Core i5-12400 or anything lower end than that, and you don't, for whatever reason, plan any future CPU upgrades, at least on that board, then they're gonna be good enough. And that's gonna do it for part one of my B660 VRM thermal testing. If you enjoyed this video, please do give it a like. Uh, it took over a month, as I said, to get all of this testing done. And we also had to purchase a lot of these boards because companies like ASUS don't wanna send out their budget boards a lot of the time. So that, yeah, they weren't, um, they weren't keen on that. We, they did provide higher end models, but they're these cheaper, lower end models, not super keen on. Uh, and we also had to put, purchase the Soyo and Max Sun boards. So I think it was like six out of the 10 boards featured in this video we actually purchased. So big thank you to our Patreon and Floatplane members for making that possible. And on that note, if you would like to join us, then yeah, Floatplane Patreon, links for those are in the video description. You also get some pretty cool perks in return. It doesn't just fund cool content like this that you don't generally see elsewhere. Uh, it also gives you access to our exclusive Discord server. Uh, monthly live streams, Q and A's, and behind the scenes content. So a lot of cool stuff there. If you're interested, check it out. But if not, perfectly fine. And I would like to thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.